Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to see so many of you join from around the world for today's webinar. I'm Daniel from ISWA, and I'm moderating today's webinar looking at energy recovery and the Green Deal. We'll be joined by three experts who will briefly introduce and discuss the topic, followed by a short Q&A with the audience. So please type your questions in the chat box in the bottom corner, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. So what is the topic today? Um, waste to energy. Um, to put it very simply, it's the burning of municipal solid waste that could not be prevented or recycled. The waste is treated to create energy, which is used to generate electricity and hot water. This thermal treatment of municipal solid waste is the subject of intense debate and scrutiny. But strict controls are required in order to prevent the emission of any harmful pollutants into the air, land and water. And in this webinar, we'll consider the role of this technology in a proper, well-functioning, sustainable and integrated waste management system. We'll consider the role it can play in a circular economy and any green, any green deal means for waste to energy technology. Before I introduce you to our speakers, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction since many of you joining yet, joining today might not be members of ISWA. Um, first of all, thank you to our sponsors, um, Veolia, the city of Rotterdam, Ecomondo and IFAT. And of course, thank you to our platinum members. Um, this webinar comes to you for free. We make it free because part of ISWA's mission is the development of sustainable waste management through education and training. We want, it, we want to promote appropriate and best available, te available technologies and practices, not only waste to energy, but all waste treatment options. However, we do absolutely rely on the support of our members to be able to do this. I know many of you watching today are not members, so I do encourage you to click the link here or just contact me directly. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with ISWA, and I hope you're few, um, we're a global, independent, non-profit association working in the public interest to promote and develop sustainable and professional waste and resource management worldwide. We have members in 110 countries, representing the public and private sectors, academia, non-governmental organizations, and even individuals with a passion for waste. If you share our vision and mission, then please join us. And with that, I would like to introduce you to our speakers. Um, Johnny, can you quickly introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Johnny uh, and I'm working in Oslo as a production director for from the waste uh, management agency here, which is operating the, the the plants for the municipal waste here. And I'm also chair of the wor uh, working group for energy recovery in ISVA. And I'll talk mostly about uh, why we think waste to energy is a very good technology and what is the key aspects of it as it as of today and what will be the key aspects in the future so uh, if i do like this do yeah good um i will talk a little bit about the nimby uh, effect and how safe it is can it be a final sink? What about the lock-in discussion that we will get when we discuss uh, these huge investments in, in the municipalities and in the societies? Uh, how can waste energy work in CO2 mitigation and will it counteract recycling or will it actually uh, uh, make it stronger? And also, how can waste to energy be a recycling uh, um, solution for some of the uh, more, uh, let's say, marginal uh, materials? Um, I guess uh, waste management was one of the original Nimbus. Uh, London and New York were the first big cities to pass laws against this, or to treat this in 1846 in London and 1875 in New York, I think, and then in 1895, uh, making it an agency. And this was to make sure that people actually could live in cities, uh, not being uh, overrun by waste or smell or, or diseases. But at that time, it was always done at night. It was always done out of sight. And the first incinerator actually was built already in 1874. The picture is of one of the original uh, night men, as they call them in Oslo, from the early uh, 1900s. Um, and so I guess we've always been treating the NIMBY, uh, NIMBY discussion in the waste energy sector. And this is very strong still. If you plan to build a new waste to energy plant, you will always meet strong neighboring 
uh, resistance and also a lot of N uh, NGO resistance. That's that's the way of life, and you have to treat it, and you have to to treat it with information and communication and and uh, and um, uh, dialogue. And then I'll talk a little bit, or, and and I'll tell you a little bit about how safe this technology is. The first incinerator in Nottingham were a very pollutant plant. It did uh, leave ash clouds uh, in the vicinity of the city. It was uh, no flue gas treatment, treatment, very close to an open burning, but it was the first one. And then what we see today in this industry is probably the strictest regulations of any industry. We have very, very strict emission limits in, in Europe, uh, very, very strict uh, treatment rules, and we are in the scrutiny of every uh, municipality that we, that we um, live in. That has made us uh, live by the rules and also treat the rules and also try to visualize or make the results as uh, uh, transparent as possible on what is the emissions of this industry and, and it is really really low and but still it has to be robust enough to take care of big variations in the waste that comes because we are there to treat the residual everything that cannot be recycled or cannot be washed or used again that comes to the waste to energy plants and then we need to be both robust and very very um, broad in our treatment of the flue gases to make sure that this is safe and it is um no other way that way and then another aspect is the final sink <clears throat> eu has said that within 2035 we should have none no landfill at all uh, that is a very hard goal to reach but still in in the way uh, to this goal we will have a 45 and 40 and 35 percent residual waste after the recycling goal of 65 percent and landfill is not an option waste energy is probably the best way of treating this uh, and then we can get rid of the landfills uh, as almost in, uh, almost completely and then the waste energy will be the final thing. We have done this in Norway and Sweden and in De uh, Denmark and the Netherlands and also in Germany. We don't really have any landfills anymore for the municipal waste. And we have then through 10, 15, 20 years in some countries uh, demonstrated that uh, waste energy can be the final thing. And then we will get a new, uh, new statistics in Euro e EU and in Europe next years counting recycling in another numbers. We know that these numbers will probably be much weaker than they are today because today we count recycling going into the recycling plant and not going out from the recycling plant. And this is changing. We will now actually count what is going out from the recycling plants as a secondary raw material or as a product. The rest of the the, the rest of the materials from these recycling plants will have to go somewhere else and probably waste energy will be one of the best options for that. And then the volume, still 60, 70, 80, maybe 90 million tons in, still in Europe goes to landfill. Building waste energy as we close landfills will be a, a, a very high uh, demand for uh, to make sure that we can take care of the waste and if we are going there uh, we can phase out the older waste energy when and if the residual volume sinks the picture on on the right of the screen is um a in in copenhagen on the left of in the picture is the old plant which is now closed and on the right this is the most famous one for the moment i think with the ski slope on top is the new plant with much better equipment to tackle the emission limits, much better uh, energy recovery and all of things. Uh, the original plant was built in 68, 69, and this one is now 15 years, uh, three, four years in the making. 
So these factors contract very contract very strongly a lock-in effect. CO2 mitigation. Waste energy is a many very small CO2 emissions gather in one place from all of the inhabitants in a, in a city. Half of the CO2 is biogen, a big potential for carbon negativity if you can take all the CO2 out. And then there is the energy, which is replacing the fossil energy. And yesterday, uh, the news came from the UK about Suez building a new waste energy plant in the UK and then um, building carbon capture on that plant as well. So the technology is already there to make sure that these solutions can be carbon negative. And then secondary recycling or counteracting recycling, we see that in the bottom ash and in the fly ash, we can actually establish uh, processes to recycle uh, uh, valuable metals, uh, uh, very uh, seldom metals and all of these things. These are just samples of what the fly ash and the bottom ash in Oslo uh, has. We know that integrated waste management is far more important for recycling than specific technologies uh, and that the landfill ban works. So a ga gate fee on the incineration should be high to promote recycling solutions before incineration. But incineration as is, is and should be the final sink and always a part of integrated waste management solution. Thank you. Thanks very much, Johnny, for the quick introduction to the topic. Um, so I just want to quickly introduce you to our other two speakers. Ella, can you introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Ella Stengler. I'm the Managing Director of CWAP, the Confederation of European Waste to Energy Plants. And this is the European Umbrella Association of the Operators of Waste to Energy Plants. So within CWAP, we represent more than 400 uh, plants in Europe. And our members are committed to state-of-the-art uh, treatment of non-recyclable waste and turning it into secure energy. Thanks, Ella. And Christoph. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Daniel. Uh, I am Christophe Cordom. I'm uh, the uh, development director of uh, CNIM company uh, based in, uh, in France. Uh, we are designing and building uh, um, waste treatment facilities, so material from waste, but also energy from waste. And our plants are treating the waste of more than 110 million people in the world. And we are also building flue gas treatment as the one which is uh, uh, installed on the uh, Copenhagen uh, waste energy plant that uh, Johnny has shown. Uh, I am also the vice chair of the working group energy recovery of ISVA. Thank you, Christoph. So um, we've got a few questions prepared for the panel. So I'll ask you all to turn on your cameras and your microphones. Um, Christoph, I'll direct the first question at you, but Johnny and Ella, if you have anything to add, please go ahead. Um, First question is quite simple, Christoph. What is the role of waste to energy within the circular economy? Uh, the first role, I believe, is really to keep it clean. Uh, and as it is written in the uh, uh, last uh, document from uh, Europe concerning the circular economy package, which has been published at the beginning of this year, uh, it's written that we should have a clean circular economy. And uh, as it has been said by uh, Johnny, uh, one of the role of the waste to energy uh, is uh, what was called in the past uh, hygienic role, hygienization, uh, and this is very important to keep uh, this uh, circular uh, economy clean. Um, of course, it has also uh, of a um, very important um, asset and advantage, uh, which is to have a complementary tool to high quality uh, recycling. Uh, we need to have high quality recycling to avoid to send uh, our waste uh, abroad uh, or in Asia or, or in Africa, for example, as we have seen recently. And, um, and of course, based on that, we have polluted residual waste uh, to treat, which are non-recyclable. And, and the best way and the only solution uh, to avoid landfilling is a waste uh, to energy. And finally, uh, it's to recover resources. Uh, it's to recover two types of resources. 
first materials because we recover minerals and also uh, metals out of a process of waste energy and also what is uh, in the name we recover energy and this is local this is renewable uh, in majority uh, energy and uh, not delocalized so we avoid to uh, import uh, uh, energy uh, that we are lacking a lot in the European uh, Union. So you see there are a lot of uh, very important aspects uh, to, to say that uh, really waste energy is uh, an important uh, tool and an important gear, let's say, an important wheel in the gear of the waste uh, treatment uh, for the European Union and also for the world. Thanks, Christoph. Um, Ella, do you have anything to add to what Christoph just said? Well, I think Christoph was very comprehensive in his answer. I think you you managed to summarize uh, um, to summarize it all. So I think uh, just in a nutshell, um, to summarize it again, it is really the sanitizing task that waste to energy fulfills for the society, the hygienization, the pollutant sink and at the same time producing um, secure energy, it is baseload energy, and recycling metals from the bottom ash and from the mineral part of the bottom ash uh, that can be used as secondary aggregates. So I don't want to repeat what Christoph has very, very well said already. Okay, but I will stick with you, Ella, for the next question. We, we say that um, waste to energy is the option after all um, recycling and prevention options have been considered. So. What happens, what is the status, um, what is the role of waste to energy in the future? What position does it take if we achieve all of our recycling targets and reduction targets? Yes, well, we have some uh, ambitious recycling targets in the circular economy, which is good. Although they should in the future be even more ambitious and not only focus on municipal waste, but also on commercial and industrial waste, because municipal waste is only a small part of the host, uh, whole uh, waste volume. Uh, but definitely more recycling means also more residues from sorting and recycling facilities, which need uh, environmentally sound treatment. So uh, waste to energy is there complementary to recycling by treating the rejects from recycling facilities and it goes hand in hand with recycling. And um, yeah, well, we made a peer reviewed calculation based on the uh, 2035 targets set by the circular economy for residual waste treatment. So once the, these uh, targets in 2035 will be achieved, um, then um, uh, assuming similar strict targets for commercial and industrial waste, there will be still a need to treat a huge amount of residual waste uh, in Europe, around 140 million tons we calculated. Uh, and the current capacity of waste to energy and co incineration is far below this amount, about 100 million tons. So we see uh, there's a gap in uh, residual waste treatment, uh, and we can only avoid this if we do a better job and prevent much more waste, which we should, of course, do. But um, it's also uh, not easy because eco design and consumer behavior would be necessary to change and that takes time but definitely this is something uh, that we uh, should approach but until we have achieved uh, to be much much better on waste prevention so for the next decades waste to energy will be necessary to treat uh, the residual waste uh, we have put this um, calculation online so uh, everybody can play with it. So if you want to assume more ambitious figures or targets, you can see how much waste uh, or residual waste treatment um, capacity will be needed. And so, yeah, you can play with it. But in our uh, default approach, we have already um, uh, took as a basis quite uh, conservative uh, approaches. Yeah, so I think with a circular economy and uh, the need to treat in an environmentally sound way the rejects from sorting and recycling facilities, we will need waste to energy to complement quality recycling also in the future. Thanks. Um, Johnny, Christoph, follow, just keeping with this question, do you see any, any reason why we might not need waste to energy in the future whatsoever? Uh, 
N no, not really. Uh, one of the main things that bother me is that what we see on materials coming into the market is more and more mixed due to the uh, things that you want your products to be able to do. But then these materials are more and more difficult to recycle even uh, if uh, even if you have to add more energy or more complex processes to make it happen so uh, waste energy will always be there to make sure that we can recycle energy and also recycle as i said some of the uh, metals from that comes from these materials that's the only way uh, and I, I think we should con concentrate us on facing out landfill first and then maybe in the far 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 future waste to energy can be obl oblivious yes maybe to to, to complete what johnny has said uh, i think we could also take the examples of the of the existing countries which are sometimes more in advance uh, uh, than some of us uh, and for example when we have a look to countries which has a very good image of uh, very environmental friendly or, or very clean countries. Uh, so in general, we, you have in mind the Scandinavian countries or Switzerland or, or I don't know, Singapore or Taiwan. Uh, when we have a look uh, uh, to, to these countries, uh, they, they go very far in sorting selective collections of a number of uh, different flows uh, to go to very high quality recycling and go very far in the in this recycling but at the end they have residual uh, municipal waste which are mixed waste uh, uh, and non-recyclable waste and and the solution in these countries uh, is the uh, state-of-the-art uh, waste to energy uh, facilities so if we take these examples of these countries, which are really well in, in advance for a very good municipal waste uh, management, uh, I, I believe it's also giving uh, the, the path for the, for the future of the rest of the countries. Okay, thank you. Um, Christoph, we, we've talked about recycling targets and waste reduction targets, but we also have in the EU some quite tough carbon emission targets. Does waste to energy, will waste to energy play a role in achieving this? Yes, definitely. It's a very important target. And in fact, it's also an easy, uh, easy win uh, uh, target. Uh, it's a hanging fruit that we have there uh, to, uh, to reduce the climate, uh, to, to reduce the greenhouse gases coming from the waste sector. Um, when uh, organic waste are landfilled or even worse, uh, open dumped, they are producing a very nasty uh, greenhouse gas, which is methane. Methane is 24 times more uh, dangerous than uh, CO2. If you are uh, talking on 100 years calculation, but it's even 86 times more dangerous it's, uh, if it's on 20 years. So uh, it has been shown that this methane production, uh, first, we find it in the atmosphere the concentration of methane in the atmosphere has not been uh, plus 50% as CO2. Uh, everybody knows that the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere uh, has increased, but the methane concentration has been tripled in the industrial area. And uh, this methane has a huge impact on climate change uh, and on the temperature increase. And this is hanging fruit because we know that if we close the landfills and avoid this organic waste going to landfill. We avoid this methane uh, production and release to the atmosphere. And this is done by uh, waste to energy. So this is the first aspect is to uh, avoid these methane emissions from the landfills. The second aspect is that we are producing uh, energy. And by this way, we are replacing uh, fossil fuel uh, energy uh, uh, supply, which is done uh, in average in the in the countries, uh, and energy is uh, is 75 to 80 percent of all the greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So replacing this fossil fuel uh, emissions, we have a second uh, effect of waste energy, and this is why, by nature, only with green uh, landfill diversion and this. Uh, 
fossil fuel uh, diversion uh, to install waste energy, we are reducing, we are mitigating CO2 uh, emissions uh, from the waste sector. Just to, as a conclusion, just two examples, uh, recent examples uh, in, in Europe. First, uh, Finland and then UK, they have switched from landfilling. It was 75% landfilling in, in UK uh, in the 2000s. They have managed to go down by landfill uh, taxes and ban down to 17%, 75 to 17%. And they have divided by four the CO2 emissions uh, from the waste sector. It was more or less 10% of the total greenhouse gas emissions uh, in UK, and now it's less than 2.5%. So really, it's it's a very important aspect of the waste energy, and it's an easy way to reduce uh, uh, the uh, the climate change impact of a waste of a waste sector. Thanks, Christoph. Um, does anybody, Johnny Ella, do you have anything to add to Christoph's comments? Uh, um, I, his, his comment. Additionally, um, there is also greenhouse gas savings from metal recycling from the bottom edge. Of course, first you have to um, so separate, but sometimes you cannot easily separate metals from from the waste, and then it's still better to take the metals out from the bottom edge because the quality of the metals is, is still there and you can still recycle it after the incineration process. Uh, so you save, uh, in, in Europe, you save 3.8 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions by recycling uh, the metals from, from the bottom ash. And um, also, of course, um, we have to reduce the plastic waste at the first place that is going into waste to energy plants. We are all clear about that. But there are always some remaining uh, plastic parts in the residual waste. And this is where the CO2 commission, uh, emissions from waste to energy come from. Uh, but I see it as a service to society that waste to energy plants take these uh, plastic waste, which are not nice, of course, because they cause CO2 emissions. But um, this is the non-recycled plastic waste. And the only alternative would otherwise be landfilling. Uh, with other environmental impacts. So I think it's uh, still better to treat it in uh, waste to energy plants where uh, they are um, uh, yeah, looked after in a, in a very cautious way and where the pollutants are destroyed in a, in, in a safe way. And of course, for the, for the fossil fuels, uh, fossil based uh, CO2 emissions, uh, the waste to energy operators are looking more and more into carbon capture and use and storage, but was already mentioned by Johnny earlier. I could add a little bit to that as well, because uh, carbon capture has been demonstrated already as a technology on waste to energy plant and already been built. I would say semi full scale in in Holland a couple of times now, uh, just the recent years. Um, one other thing of that is that you take out as much, at least in in the waste composition that we have in Northern Europe, half of what we CO two that we take out is biogen biogenic. This means that this can uh, this can make up for other industries or other processes in the society that are not that easy to decarbonize. So you can really uh, say that uh, you using a waste of energy actually makes other non-decarbonizable uh, industries possible to run, at least for a time being. Uh, so uh, it will be a double bonus on if you actually are able to run a carbon capture plant uh, with a waste of energy. Of course, it's an expensive solution, but if you compare it with other CO2 mitigating uh, actions, it is cheap. You cannot uh, only count it on the waste, but if you become compare it in Oslo, if you compare it with what we pay for every ton of CO2 that we reduce on the electrical vehicles, which we have a lot of uh, here, the cost is much lower on a, uh, a carbon capture plant on the waste energy than on these vehicles per ton of CO2. 
Thanks, Johnny. We've got a lot of chat and questions coming up, so we, we will come to them after the after the this interview, but be patient with us. Um, the next question for is for Christoph. And um, can you tell us how we can reduce our dependence on raw materials and how waste energy can support this? Um, yes, thank you, Daniel. Um, if you have a look on the European Directive uh, for the Circular Economy, one very important point, of course, in this circular economy is to reduce the dependence of the European Union to raw materials. Um, and if you have a look to the metabolism, let's say like that, of, of the European Union, uh, we have mainly four types of raw materials. We have biomass, and in fact, uh, the balance between ba export and import in European Union uh, is already good for the, for the biomass. It's almost the same also for uh, minerals, uh, non-metallic uh, ores, uh, where we've managed to have domestic uh, uh, resource uh, in European Union for uh, non-metallic uh, uh, minerals. The situation is already a little bit different for metals. Uh, European Union is dependent on import for the metals. And, uh, and there is a good, very good recycling of these metals uh, in Europe for a number of metals. Not all of them, because some of them are very difficult. But for example, for iron, uh, for copper, for aluminium, we have already a very good recycling. Nevertheless, first, there is an increase in the stock and we should not forget that. And this point is very important in developing countries because uh, in developing countries, they extract uh, uh, raw materials first to have stocks, to build uh, the houses, to have electric wires uh, in copper and things like that. But to return first uh, to European Union, so we are importing metals. And uh, what are the solutions whatever the solutions are uh, to recycle uh, the metals we are uh, throwing away, uh, it's good. And waste energy is a very good solution for that. Uh, we have uh, experience of what we could call direct urban mining in uh, waste energy. Uh, there is a very nice uh, project and experience and reference in Switzerland to recover, for example, zinc from uh, fly ashes from uh, waste energy. But the, the fourth uh, raw material type, where we are very, very dependent on import, is fossil energy carriers, fossil fuels. We are completely dependent on the import of uh, this raw material. And this is very important because this is the energy source. Uh, and uh, in France, for example, we are 100% almost dependent on the import of uh, fossil uh, uh, carriers. And uh, we have in our beans energy, which is local, which is renewable, which is available, and which will not uh, stop uh, uh, from one day to another, uh, which is not uh, um, linked to the volatility of prices on the international market. Uh, this is there. And this is available for the citizens who are producing uh, the waste and uh, who are needing the energy. And one of the problem is that we are talking in resources, we are talking a lot of materials, which is of course very important. Whatever is possible to recycle is very important for climate change, for uh, the, the, to avoid to, 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 to waste uh, uh, materials, but without energy. Unfortunately, energy is very cheap for the moment. It will not last like that. But without the energy, we cannot do anything because we are now uh, dependent on the number of machines, 200 machines it has been uh, calculated around us because we are, we are dependent of a, a lot of machines for, uh, for our daily life. And for that, we need energy. 
So definitely, uh, this is also a way to reduce the dependency of the uh, European Union to raw materials. And this is what is hidden also in the adjective circular. We need an economy for Europe, which is circular, and the circle is Europe itself, uh, where the materials and resources should uh, keep it, should be kept kept, sorry, uh, in the European uh, frontiers. Thanks, Christoph. Um, jo Johnny and Ella, do you have anything to add to his comments? No, well, not this one. For the um, metal recycling, I absolutely uh, agree. And also the mineral fraction of the bottom as she gets more and more attention. Uh, there's a United Nations Environment Programme report about uh, sand and gravel extraction, um, which is one of the major sustainability challenges of the 21st century, they call it. And this is also something um, uh, where the mineral part of bottom ash can replace gravel and sand. And so, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and covers the growing demand of that. And additionally, also, of course, energy is the raw material that we don't have in Europe. And um, according to a, um, a study from the Commission's Joint Research Center, uh, we landfill uh, 1,400 petajoule of energy content in landfills in, in Europe. That is almost 13% um, of the total energy consumption of households uh, in the EU. And at the same time, we import half of, its, of our energy needs to a very high price. So I think this is uh, this is a resource that we should definitely use better in Europe. Um, we, Johnny, we just kind of, we've kind of touched on it a few times already a little bit, but can you tell us in a clear way why waste to energy is a better, in your opinion, than landfill? Why it is? Um, um, first of all, if you place uh, 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 average ton of waste on a landfill today it releases the equivalent of more than three tons of co2 uh, into the atmosphere of uh, that, this is methane but it's the equivalent of three tons of co2 an average ton of waste um, if you burn it in an incinerator and doesn't really use any of the energy just burn it down with good flue gas emissions um, you will uh, release one ton of co2 uh, so that the, at that point you reduce the impact of CO two already very uh, significantly, and then um, a waste energy plant is a collection of inter very small emissions that either comes from a, 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 a landfill or other places where you get waste. At the waste energy plant, you have one single source, and that's actually. Uh, able to treat it there. So um, for the CO2 uh, question, not uh, not uh, that is absolutely the best uh, solution. Uh, for the recycling of metals or, as I said, in complex uh, mixed materials, recycling of metals, rare metals, uh, uh, precious metals, uh, this is also probably a solution that is better and more energy-wise than other recycling uh, solutions as we see them today. Hopefully in the future other processes will come up, but uh, as Christoph said, the energy production is still the most climate-intensive uh, industry we have. So if we can do this without using energy, and we sort of do that in waste energy, then this is also a good recycling um, process for these materials that we find uh, in trace uh, elements of uh, different materials. Thank you. Um, so I think I think we all recognize that um, land, both landfilling and energy recovery are less favored options in terms of the waste hierarchy. But um, a recent report by UNEP on plastic pollutants suggested that waste energy sits at the very bottom of the waste hierarchy. Ella, could you clarify this for us where it should actually sit. Uh, yes, actually, I was really uh, very concerned when I saw uh, this suggestion because I, I think, um, well, waste 
to energy, Western summation with energy recovery should definitely be higher in the hierarchy than uh, landfilling. So um, I was very surprised about that. Um, so the waste hierarchy aims to maximize the value of the waste um, uh, while protecting the human health and environment. And that is why waste to energy is above landfilling. And waste which cannot be prevented should be recycled if possible. And when this is not possible, because it's too contaminated, uh, it contains substances of concern, or it is recycled already several times, and so the material is um, uh, degraded, this waste still has a value through the energy it contains, as we said already several times, and also through the, the, the recovery from the, the bottom ash. So I think it's clear that, uh, and it's also clear in, in European law that energy recovery is higher up the hierarchy than um, landfill disposal. Mm -hmm. Yes, Christophe. Just, just one comment. It's very clear in the European directive that in the waste treatment hierarchy, uh, waste energy is above uh, landfill for two aspects. First, the environmental impact and also for the climate change. It is written like that in this uh, uh, waste treatment hierarchy. So this is uh, absolutely clear. Uh, just another comment also to, to, to this document. It's also written nevertheless in this document that the, the best way uh, to avoid uh, toxic compounds like uh, persistent organic pollutants, uh, the best way to treat them is to have state-of-the-art uh, energy from waste. Uh, so, uh, um, and, and this is a very important aspect is to, as I said from the beginning, clean the circular economy and keep it keep away the hazardous substances from uh, recycling. Okay, thank you. So finally, just a slight change of topic, but we're often asked about the treatment of PPE waste that is at the moment. So um, can somebody tell me what the what role incineration has played in the treatment of dangerous pathogens during the current pandemic? Maybe Christoph, you can answer this. Uh, it, it has been a very important uh, role, which is uh, uh, hygienic uh, role. Uh, first, for example, in many countries, uh, for example, in France, uh, waste to energy has been declared, have been declared, sorry, uh, as essential uh, activities. And they have not been stopped during uh, lockdown. Uh, and on the contrary, uh, the government has uh, pushed really very uh, importantly to, to, to continue the uh, operation of the waste to energy uh, facilities as a waste treatment. And on the, of course, on the uh, individual protection uh, equipment that now we are using, like masks and gloves and things like that, uh, they, 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 they might be they are not all polluted, but they might be polluted, of course, by, by the virus. And uh, to be sure that we destroy this type of pathogens, it's also very important. We, we should not spread this type of uh, uh, equipment in the environment, uh, and especially, of course, in uh, recycling. So please, uh, when you have uh, your masks, don't throw them in the recycling bin, uh, because it's dangerous for our people who are working uh, and operate this type of facilities, but put it in, in in small bags and put it in our in the black bins with residual waste. Uh, and hopefully, if you have a chance to have a waste energy plants, they will be uh, uh, destroyed. Or the other solution, if you can, uh, wash them to to reuse it, then, if it's possible. Uh, some of them are, are, are reusable, but at the end, when you have washed them for too many times uh, and they are not used, uh, it's not possible to use them again, throw them away in, uh, the, in the black bin with residual waste uh, for the destruction. Thanks, Christoph. So um, that comes to the end of our questions, but um, fortunately we have a lot of questions from our audience today. So I will start with a question from Rion from South Africa. Um, he says that we've proven the technical and financial feasibility of waste energy in cities in South Africa, but we're struggling with the social aspect. What, in your opinion, is the single most beneficial aspect about waste energy that we can use to convince the public to change their minds? I would say the health aspect, 
uh, keeping keeping uh, as Christoph mentioned uh, pathogens but also other uh, pollutants out of the system uh, that is probably the best aspect instead of a landfill which is probably the most polluted places on earth so uh, that for me that would that is the most important one and maybe um Maybe the, the, the participants have seen the images we have shown behind us. Uh, a number of these facilities are really implemented in the city centers. There, there has been a study from the uh, University of New York showing that uh, most of these uh, facilities in the world, which are around 1,000, are very close to city center because they are designed for that. It's a very compact solution. Uh, we avoid to use uh, a lot of land, like on with landfill, and uh, we could install them directly in the city center. The Amager plant in Copenhagen is one kilometer away from the Queen Palace. Uh, the Monaco plant is 500 meters from the Prince Palace. Uh, I, I'm not a royalist, I'm a French guy, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's really built and designed to be in the city center. And, and, and of course, uh, it's not possible to install such equipment if it's not safe for the human health and for the environment. And uh, this is, uh, and I think all these examples are also very interesting to to quote and to show to the public that this is designed to be safe and clean. Thanks, and um, Ella. I think maybe just give you a chance to answer that as well because you see where you invest a lot of energy into um countering NIMBY as well so what what did you find to see what was the best single argument for this yeah well i would emphasize again again uh, again and again the sanitation task that waste to energy has since the beginning it was the main purpose of waste to energy it was uh, it was built in the 19th century when there were diseases and this is still a very important task all the other things are very nice to, to recover energy, to recycle metals. It's all necessary, uh, but the main task is in, indeed the hygienic one. So health and environmentally safe treatment, destroying pollutants, acting as a pollutant sink. But in principle, I think communication is, and information is the most important tool to get uh, people on board. I know that um, that in, in uh, regions where people are more familiar with waste to energy plants, uh, they see the benefits, they see the health benefits and they see uh, the energy, the local energy that is produced there. Whereas um, in regions uh, where there is no waste to energy, there is more precaution, there is more prejudice. So there's more communication necessary that uh, waste energy is a part of the solution and not of the problem. Thank you. Um, I, will, I will address this one because we've had a, quite a few questions about this. Um, you're obviously aware that waste incineration is not included in the list of sustainable and climate friendly solutions when it comes to EU taxonomy discussion. What are your feelings on this? Well, I very, very much regret this. It is actually, um, um, I, I, I can't understand why waste to energy should not be eligible as a sustainable project, let's say in, uh, in, in cases when it replaces landfills or when it replaces an old energy from waste facility and with a new one being more energy efficient. Uh, or for hospital waste, or for sewage sludge that should not be uh, brought on, 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 the, on the soil, it contains heavy metals. So there are plenty of cases, I imagine, when investing in waste to energy is very sustainable. And that's why, yeah, I regret very, very much that this is not recognized in the taxonomy. I hope this will change us at a um, and is uh, is any change possible or likely, or is that? Well, it's work in, in progress. Uh, it's true the first delegated act was proposed by the Commission on Climate Mitigation and Adaptation. And on the other, like pollution prevention and circular economy, 
this will be worked on um, as from next year. Okay. Um, Johnny, we've had a few questions also about um, the capture of CO2 generated from waste to energy. Can you tell us what the options are for this at the moment? What the current status of this is? I understand you're, you yourself are working on a trial plant in Oslo. So. Yeah, um, there is carbon capture has been a process that has been available for maybe 50 years in industries like urea production and etc. And has been used with A mine solutions, which are big uh, facilities, expensive facilities to build but also ammonia solution sol solvents. That is applicable and has been tested and also been built, as I said, in the, whole, in the Netherlands uh, during the last year. Uh, what we see now is that they're coming new technologies, more compact te technologies, more or maybe even membrane technologies coming to catch CO2 from these plants. Uh, and we expect a lot of uh, new a more efficient technologies, which is also more uh, uh, smaller to build and uh, by that smaller to invest in, uh, to come during the next maybe five to ten years. Uh, but they are still not that proven as an amine solution or as an uh, ammonia solution is. Um, it is a standard chemical process with absorption and stripping, so the, 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 the process itself is not the problem, but you have to be very... Uh, you need to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to observe the emissions from the CO2 capture plant very uh, closely. And that is uh, why it does take long time to, app uh, to apply it in industries because you need to make sure that the technology is safe. We have tested for almost two years running and uh, we can see now that with some extra measures it's safe but um, uh, there is technology available for industrial sizes. Um, and uh, if, if anybody wants to have more detailed information about that uh, get in touch with me and i can i can guide you further on to other experts thank you uh christoph do you have anything to add to the comments on ccu or uh, what in the uh, one of the experience that johnny has quoted is the one in netherlands and what is interesting is that it's not uh, CCS, it's CCU. So they are uh, using this uh, CO2 for a greenhouse uh, uh, culture. Uh, they have uh, a, a lot of them uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, they are replacing fossil uh, fuel consumption by this CO2 coming from, uh, from the waste. So this is also a very interesting example of uh, recycling uh, uh, of gas this time, which is the CO2 contained in the in the flue gases. Okay, just to play devil's advocate and pick up one of the questions in the chat. Is it actually financially feasible? This? What is the return? The return is a cheaper way to mitigate CO2 than many other uh, process that, uh, processes that we have, but it has to be more or cheaper than it is today. But for the time being, uh, it is a way to do it and it's a way to introduce it and uh, for cities like Oslo and some other cities that doesn't really have industries in their midst anymore this is one of the main sources for CO2 uh, emissions today in such cities so it's a very good source to to capture it from and it's quite simple Okay. I have a question from Jose Davila. Um, in underdeveloped countries, the waste has more than 50% of organic waste, so it's quite has a high emission content. Can you talk about how this impacts the efficiency of waste to energy plants? Um, this is uh, this is quite common in a number of countries which ha which have decided to go to waste energy, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, let's take the example of China. Uh, when we have started to build uh, the first energy from waste in China uh, uh, in uh, 2000 in, uh, in Shanghai Pudong, uh, the calorific value of the waste is about half the calorific value that we are uh, finding uh, in Europe. It's about five megajoules per kilo 
compared to them in, in Europe. Because of the organic content, because of the moisture that we could find in, in the waste. Nevertheless, with the technology that uh, we are uh, using uh, in this sector, uh, which is mainly based on uh, mechanical grade, uh, we can handle this low calorific value without any pretreatment. The most, the most important impact uh, of this high uh, moisture of the waste and high organic content is that sometimes we could find some water in the waste uh, pit and we have to uh, treat this water uh, before uh, uh, the, tr the treatment of the waste. But this is not a very important uh, technical uh, difficulty, so it's possible uh, 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 to have this uh, high uh, and well, let's say wet uh, organic, high content of organic uh, waste uh, uh, burning. It's burning. It's very important also to understand that it's that it's a fuel. Even if with this uh, high uh, organic content, it continues to be uh, a fuel and we don't need to have uh, other fuels like gas or uh, coal or whatever uh, to, uh, to, to produce uh, the energy from the waste energy. Because a lot of people think that uh, we are adding some fuels to, to keep it uh, run. So it's possible. Uh, another example uh, is that is the first plant which has been built in Africa, in Addis Abeba, close to the open dumping of uh, Addis Abeba. It has been financed by the Chinese, but now it's uh, burning the waste, the municipal waste of this uh, city of Addis Abeba in Ethiopia. So there are a number of examples uh, uh, already uh, there. Uh, showing that uh, it could be uh, treated without any pretreatment uh, in our facilities. Thanks. Um, Ella, um, following that question about waste energy in developing countries, would you say there are situations where countries absolutely should not look to waste energy? Are there, are there certain conditions that should be met before it should be considered? Well, yes, you definitely have to uh, to invest in state-of-the-art technology. Otherwise, there shouldn't be any compromises on environmental uh, requests and environmental standards. And of course, you need to educate also people to, to, to operate the plant properly. So this should be really ensured by training the people to make sure that the, the, the plant is operated in a, in a proper way. Thank you. Johnny, this is, this is something that we've discussed often in uh, our working group. Um, what, what, what would you say to that? It's important. If you want to install a waste energy plant, you need to have an integrated waste management system. If you don't have a waste management system, you don't want to buy a waste energy plant. And a waste management system uh, comprises of good information, good uh, ownership of the waste, uh, good uh, collection systems, uh, probably sorting systems, and also biological treatment systems. But the technologies can vary, and also the, how much technology you want to put in it, but you have to have a very good waste management system to make sure that the waste energy plant works well. Thanks. Um, so we we also hear a lot about different technologies. So waste energy is a broader term which does encompass different technologies. So it could be gasification, plasma, uh, pyrolysis. Um, are there are these other alternative technologies feasible or viable options? Maybe Christoph. Uh, uh, yes, you, you you could hear uh, and also read and uh, to uh, to see some um, a lot of news con considering uh, alternative thermal treatments and very different types of technologies for the thermal treatment of municipal waste. Uh, first, if you have a look on the statistics on the plants which are implemented in the world, uh, so they are more or less 1,000 plant which has a capacity in commercial operation with a capacity higher than five tons of municipal waste per hour. More than 90% of these plants are equipped with mass burn mechanical grade system, which is very adapted, very reliable system and very flexible to the waste 
heterogeneity that we are uh, facing with municipal mixed <coughs> municipal uh, solid waste. So there are different types of uh, 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 rates uh, for what pushing, uh, reverse acting, horizontal, whatever. But more than 90% of the plants are equipped with this uh, system. Then there are uh, around 5% uh, of the uh, facility equipped with fluidized bed, which is another technology which has been uh, developed initially for power plants. Um, but with fluidized bed, as it is, uh, you could imagine with uh, this name, uh, you have fluidization, meaning that you inject a lot of air from the bottom and you did and then the fuel is about is flying a little bit in this uh, furnace and to fly it's meaning that you don't need you don't uh, you couldn't accept large pieces so it's meaning that for municipal waste you need to pre-treat the waste and especially to shred uh, the waste and this operation is rather complicated for municipal waste and it's expensive so there are a number of facilities with this type of uh, technology. And then there are uh, alternative thermal treatment, uh, like uh, gasification, pyrolysis. You can hear also about plasma gasification. Most of these facilities are uh, installed uh, in Japan. Uh, and it's not for the gas production. Uh, of course, with gasification, you can produce some gas, synthetic gas, uh, from the from the waste. Uh, but nine, with 99% of the facilities, this gas is directly burned after its production. Uh, and afterwards, it's looking like any other uh, waste energy facilities with a steam boiler and flue gas treatment. Uh, there has been there have been conditions in Japan where uh, why this uh, technology has been developed in Japan, especially to have some melting of some fly ashes because they had the lack of hazardous landfills in Japan because of, of the geography, uh, geology of, uh, of the country. Nevertheless, in Japan, more than 90% of the uh, plants are also based on great system. It's only a minority uh, with this uh, gasification plant. And it's a minority because it's more expensive. And one of the technology maybe some of the people has, have heard uh, about is plasma gasification. It's very nice uh, name, uh, very nice image because you have plasma, you have gasification. So you have the impression that it's, it must be clean uh, and very modern because of these uh, names. Uh, but there has been a, a huge failure in the United Kingdom for a plant, uh, a huge plants uh, in the north of uh, England, in Tees Valley, uh, where the, the owner of this plant uh, has lost $1 billion uh, in this building. So uh, it's not adapted to municipal waste, which is very heterogeneous. Uh, and this type of technology is much less flexible uh, and uh, is very, it's very difficult to adapt uh, its operation to very autogenous uh, uh, fuel like uh, mixed uh, municipal waste. So there are some experience, especially in Japan, but it's more expensive. You cannot produce more energy uh, than with the uh, standard conventional uh, technologies. And at the end, uh, what is very important is there are no experience to use uh, syngas, so uh, synthetic gas from municipal solid waste gasification. Because this gas is too poor in energy and also too polluted with tars, and you cannot use this gas for chemical uh, aspects. It would be very nice to, to do waste to chemicals or even waste uh, to methane, for example, but uh, with thermal solution, uh, this technology for the moment is not existing. And uh, by nature, I think it's very difficult and also very expensive to develop uh, such technologies. 
So that's why 90% of the of the plants are like more than 90%. In the last decade, it was 92% of the plants worldwide uh, were based on a great uh, system. Thanks, Christoph. Um, something that I've I've noticed in a lot of uh, conversations and amongst a lot of people is it might seem quite straightforward to you guys, but some people are still confusing incineration with open burning of waste. Um, Ella, maybe you can address that. Um, yes, that's what I noticed a lot as well, unfortunately. Well, uh, we have in, uh, in Europe um, very, very strict standards for waste incineration, sophisticated flue gas cleaning system, strict monitoring. Uh, it's all regulated very strictly and monitored strictly and only recently the new BREATH, Best Available Technique Reference Document Waste Incineration was published with even stricter rules. So I would suggest um, waste to energy is regulated in the most stringent way. Uh, and then it hurts, of course, <laughs> if it is just compared with, with open burning somewhere. So this is definitely something totally different and you should definitely not do any open fires and open burning. This is not good. Don't do it without good filters. And please don't mix it up. It's really a huge, huge difference. It's not the same. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you don't only have to go um, somewhere uh, else. I, we observe also open fires in Europe. So. Uh, particularly since China uh, is more strict with accepting our dirty waste, um, we observed a lot of uh, open fires uh, in Europe. So, not such a good development. Yeah, you talk about the open burning in Europe and we, we look at these um, very tough targets, um, very ambitious targets and people often also miss misunderstand the landfill situation in Europe. People often think that we are not landfilling in Europe, but actually not the case. There are some countries in Europe where landfilling is still above 50%. So is it really ever feasible to completely get rid of it, to achieve those targets? Well, we are. it's true. There is an impression that land, landfilling is done in Europe, which is definitely not the case. Even the current uh, circular economy package uh, allows up to 10% of municipal waste to be still landfilled and there are no targets for commercial industrial waste. So that means we still landfill in Europe 175 million tons of, uh, of waste, even not counting the mineral waste. So, and that emits a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, but not only. And this is something I would also like to address to, to Piotr from the EEB, because he fears so much the so-called lock-in effect from waste to energy and says he would prefer to put the waste on landfills because they need to be feed it. Um, but there are numerous in, uh, environmental risks associated with landfills and even for the best managed landfill, the aftercare period stretches into many decades and also there's a potential danger of leaching and the plastic waste from not sufficiently controlled landfills um, is, uh, is blown by the wind and up in, in water bodies in the ocean, lakes, rivers. So it's not only the greenhouse gas effect um, why we should try to, to, to go away from landfills. However, there will be still always a part of non-recyclable and non-recoverable, non-combustible waste that will need some landfilling. But it should be limited. Thank you. Um, Just one, uh, one example, one reference uh, which might be uh, quoted uh, concerning uh, the open burning. Um, there would be a new report from the Global uh, Waste Outlook from uh, ISVA, uh, normally beginning of uh, next year, uh, which will show that in the world, uh, open burning uh, is more than 500 million tons, uh, uh, concerning more than 500 million tons. Because often in open dumping, to have more place, they put fire and have open burning. But as it has been said by uh, Ella, it's not only happening in developing countries. Uh, there has been a study from the University of New York to, to, um, to try to um, measure the amount of dioxins emissions uh, globally in the United States. And surprisingly, the dioxins emissions in the United States uh, 
35% of the emissions were coming from unintended landfill burning. So it's a huge amount. It's a number of kilo of dioxins. And there are about 70 uh, waste energy facilities in, in the States. And the dioxins emission from this uh, uh, plant was 0.05% compared to 35% of uh, uh, dioxins coming from unintended fire in landfill. And of course, when we push to uh, for the plastic uh, recycling and when there is no solution for this recycling because it's polluted, because there is no infrastructure, and when it's coming in this type of not very good landfills, uh, and if there is an open burning of this type of plastics, uh, you could have huge emissions and huge impact on the environment with this uh, uh, terrible uh, dioxins pollution. Thanks. Um, Christoph. just this is going back to the previous question we asked you about um, alternative technologies. Someone asked a follow-up question. Um, said, what about waste to hydrogen? Is this, is, um, is this in the same stream of waste chemicals you just mentioned? Yes, I, I believe, uh, in fact, there is also uh, some experience, uh, in fact, in the waste, we have mainly carbon, hydrogens, and a number of, of elements, because we have uh, uh, biogenic content, so biomass, uh, and, and also a fossil. Uh, so we find carbon and hydrogen, but the, the most important is the, is the carbon. So even if you are going to pyrolysis, gasification, or some chemical recycling uh, to, to use the new words like that. Uh, at the end, uh, you will find a, a mixture in this gas products of uh, CO and some hydrogen. Mm. But it, it, in fact, the amount of hydrogen is, is very small compared to the, to the carbon and the waste is not a good source of hydrogen. Uh, water is a better source of hydrogen, uh, but of course it's very expensive to produce hydrogen from uh, from the water from electrolysis. Uh, on this uh, point, there is a very uh, so this is for direct production of hydrogen from the waste with thermal treatment. But there is another solution, which is with waste energy, uh, we can produce hydrogen because uh, there is a very interesting uh, experience in uh, in Germany in Wuppertal, where they have installed uh, an electrolysis of uh, water. Uh, and using the electricity, the power produced by the waste to energy. And then you could uh, produce hydrogen and this hydrogen is used for the mobility for the buses uh, in uh, Wuppertal. So this is a way to produce the hydrogen and this is a, a green hydrogen. And uh, what is very interesting with this uh, green hydrogen uh, produced with waste to energy is that is not intermittent. We can produce uh, whenever we want, because we have eight, uh, we have uh, the waste energy, which is uh, producing energy uh, all the year around, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. Uh, so we can have this production of hydrogen uh, we we are now needing, uh, and this is renewable uh, uh, hydrogen. Let's say it's blue and green and turquoise, let's say, uh, hydrogen. Uh, but it's a very interesting source of hydrogen uh, and we have already an example uh, in Germany. Thank you, Christoph. Um, Johnny, we've had a few questions about the co-combustion of alternative derived fuels within cement plants. Um, can, you, can you explain what this means and what the difference is between this and waste to energy? Um, first of all, the, the cement plant uses uh, waste with a higher calorific value. So they need maybe 17 or 15 to 18 megajoules per kilo. Uh, and standard in a municipal waste uh, solution in Europe is somewhere between nine and 13. This means that you need to have a lot of pre-treatment pre before you can use it in a, waste, uh, in a cement plant. Uh, that said, cement plant is a good addition to the capacity to take waste out of, of, of the landfills. Um, the, another uh, difference is that uh, the emission rules or emission limits on the cement 
uh, industry is not as strict as they are on the waste energy plants. Uh, so uh, if you compare that, uh, then the waste energy plant is better. Um, but as I said, it's a good uh, complement. And the third thing is that the cement plant doesn't really cover the capacity needs. They can do a lot and they can do a lot of process development to make sure that they can use waste but still they need to have fossil fuels as a mix and they cannot do as much capacity as we need. I, I think the best plant to see actually is in Norway here in uh, Nordsem, owned by, by uh, um, sorry, I forgot the big German cement uh, company. Uh, they have a, a plant that is running a very high alternative fuel mix, but still, uh, they are not enough to take care of the waste. But they are a good complement and we try to uh, coordinate and uh, work with them to make sure that we can live by the same standards. Thanks Johnny. Um, I've, seen, I've seen a couple of comments in the chat that um, waste to energy and recycling are in competition with each other. Is, is this really the case? Uh, yes, <laughs> one way. Uh, sorry to say, but if if the gate fee, if if waste management is too cheap, if uh, waste distribution should be uh, expensive, if it's too cheap, then the waste owners place the waste where it's cheapest to uh, recycle it. All waste treatment cost money and recycling uh, waste does actually cost a lot of money even though you get paid for the uh, for the raw materials in the other end and good recycling costs more than running a waste energy plant so the incineration plant or the gate fee on the incineration plant should be high to make sure that the recyclers do what the recyclers can do at first and then we take the residual so if you don't have, as I said, an, a good waste management system, then we are in competition. If you have a good waste management system with a good financial plan on it, we are uh, a needed complement and a needed part of the waste management system. Thank you. Um, Christoph Eller, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I'd like to answer to Johnny because it's obvious that Johnny comes from a rich country when he says <laughs> expensive because if you come from a country that still relies heavily on landfilling and uh, landfilling is cheaper than waste to energy then waste to energy should not, should not be expensive but okay everybody has his own background um, and uh, but I would definitely uh, agree that waste to energy uh, it does not really compete with, with recycling because it is expensive due to the sophisticated flue gas cleaning. It needs a lot of investment. It is, it is not the cheapest solution. So this per se means that um, it does not uh, directly compete with recycling. I think it's rather the contrary indeed, that it goes hand in hand with uh, waste energy and recycling because you need a reliable uh, treatment for the outlet uh, from recycling and this is waste to energy so I don't think there is a real competition in general maybe just one point to complete and maybe have uh, the other side of the view I believe the problem is that waste to energy is not uh, too cheap or it's sometimes in a number of countries as Ella said it's too expensive compared to, to landfilling, this is the first point, but I don't believe it's too cheap compared to uh, recycling. The problem is that recyclable material are too cheap. It's too expensive to produce them. And, and in fact, the problem is that the revenues you can obtain from the recycling materials is too low. And that's why there is a, a, the need of huge subsidies uh, for the recycling materials. We are uh, operating recycling facilities uh, in France, for example, and we receive a, a lot of uh, subsidies for the recycling material that we are uh, uh, obtaining. And the main problem is that uh, the virgin material is too cheap. And, 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 and that's why when we recycle these second-hand uh, materials, 
it's very difficult to sell them because you are in competition not with incineration, you are in competition with virgin materials. And this is the, the main problem. Uh, and this is not linked to, uh, to waste energy, it's linked to the, uh, to, to, to the market. Uh, the energy uh, price is too low and the material, virgin materials price is too low. This is the main problem. And as Ella said, I believe that it's really going hand in hand. And we see in the number of countries that we manage to, if we want to close and to avoid the landfill, we manage with a mixed, with a mix of solutions, which is material from waste and energy from waste. So it's really going hand in hand, I believe. I would like to support Christoph on that. The secondary raw materials are very difficult to um, have in the marketplace. We see that some initiatives coming now for on public purchasing to say that if you want to produce a product in your our country, you need to have at least five or 10 or 15% of recycled materials in that product. That will probably uh, increase much more than, than uh, taking um, waste to energy out of the equation. So waste energy is, as we said, a complement uh, and you need to have a mix of, uh, of measures to make it happen. Thank you. I think we are, we've managed to answer most of the questions um, from our audience. I want to give each of you just a little moment to kind of summarize and give a concluding statement before we say goodbye. So, Ella, would you like to go first? Um, yes, a lot has been said already, so I will be very, very brief. In a nutshell, uh, I think um, based on the title on the Green Deal, uh, I think that waste to energy uh, the sector contributes significantly to the Green Deal and is eager to do more. Um, they deal with the residual waste that nobody wants, support quality recycling because it prevents dirty or contaminated waste from entering the recycling chain and adversely impact quality. Then waste to energy helps to reduce our still high dependence on landfills, which should be minimized for all the reasons we have said already today. Then waste to energy generates value from waste to energy bottom ash, the metals uh, recycling and the um, 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 secondary raw materials, the mineral part, which replaces gravel and sand, for example, in construction works. And waste energy plants uh, fully integrate into uh, a local energy infrastructure. It is base load, so you can rely on it. And it complements uh, interfering, uh, intermittent um, uh, renewable energy sources. So it's also complementary to renewables. And again, and that was, I was happy to, to hear that the hydrogen production Wuppertal was mentioned. I think waste to energy operators look more and more uh, into being a part of sector integration. And hydrogen production from waste to energy is such an example. And I think it works well. In Wuppertal, they aim to fuel 10 city buses fueled by hydrogen, powered by the waste to energy plant, and this is how they replace diesel and contribute to low carbon um, public transport. And also they, um, other operators look into waste trucks to, to fuel them with hydrogen from waste. So I think these are all uh, encouraging uh, examples to see, uh, to see what the future of waste to energy brings. And definitely it uh, has a role to play in the and the Green Deal. Thanks. Um, Christoph. Um, as, I've, as Ella has said, I, I believe really what is very important is to have this um, clean uh, circular economy. Uh, and this is a way with, with waste energy we could have clean, safe, and also affordable energy. Uh, this is also very important in countries with uh, uh, very important uh, district heating. Uh, the, the cheapest solution to uh, supply renewable uh, heat on district heating is waste to energy. Uh, it is cheaper than, than coal, than gas, and than the other fossil fuels. And uh, there is the interesting example of Copenhagen. Uh, they have the objective to be uh, in 20, 
2025, so in five years, the first CO2 neutral uh, capital, they had the uh, the chance, and it's not only chance, uh, to uh, to have 98% of the citizens connected to district eating. And this will be, they will avoid any fossil fuels consumption for the heat of the cities with mainly two facilities, waste to energy and biomass to energy. We have seen the image of uh, the Amager plant with a ski slope, but there is close to this one, a biomass uh, uh, to energy plant, uh, the O4 plant, with very high energy efficiency. So this is also affordable. And finally, also in conclusion, I, I believe also for uh, uh, the participants in uh, developing countries, what is very important is to have their own infrastructure. And this is also the case in, in Europe. Uh, when you build a house, sorry to say that, but you need toilets in your house. And you need, because this is proximity, you don't ask to your neighbors uh, every time of the day, please uh, can I have, uh, use your toilets. Each country needs the infrastructure for the municipal waste uh, treatment and management. And this is very important. This is written in directives with the proximity principle. But when I have heard uh, at the beginning of September that there, was, there were discussions between US and Kenya to send 500 million tons of wasted plastic from US to Kenya, so-called to be recycled in Kenya. Sorry, but this is a disaster. This type of, uh, uh, unfortunately for the moment, this is not the case. But I believe that all waste should be treated by ourselves because we are producing them. And without energy, without waste, there is no life. So use what is necessary, please. Thank you, Christoph. And Johnny, finally for you. Yeah. Um... To add to these two very <laughs> knowledgeable people, but uh, seeing waste energy as a, as a kidney of the circular economy or the green deal, I would say, and make sure that we can we can actually recycle most of the things that come out from a waste energy plant, either, even the CO two, the energy, of course, and also the metals and the minerals from the from the ashes. There will always be a small, small part, but these technologies are within reach and we should develop them. And then, as Christoph has said a couple of times, waste to energy will keep the circle as clean as possible. You need to have a safety valve of the circular economy and the waste to energy is probably the best circular valve that we have. Okay, so um, we are at the end of our time now so thank you very much to our speakers um thank you to everyone who joined and thank you everyone for the lively discussion um and we'll send a recording out um in quite soon so anyone who didn't get to watch the whole thing you'll, you'll get to rewatch. so just thank you and goodbye thank you bye goodbye thank you